let's continue with image classification. And before introducing uh, specific steps and methods for image classification, I want to introduce several more concepts. Okay, so the first concept here for today is called spectral class. It's a class which includes similar grayscale vectors in feature space. So on the right hand, we have this feature space uh, formed by NIR near infrared band and red band. And we have multiple pixels here. They are marked by different numbers, for example, a one, two, three, and four. And each number represents a specific class. So we have four classes here. So now you would ask, you said uh, each class includes similar grayscale vectors instead of pixels. Why I'm saying pixels here instead of vectors? What is the difference between a vector and a pixel? Okay, so a pixel is simply the smallest unit in a remote sensing image, right? You know that, we have learned that. So what is a vector? A vector is a concept in linear algebra and a vector is nothing but a straight line with a specific direction, okay? So in order to get a vector, you need to draw a straight line. And also this straight line has a direction, okay? You can use an arrow to, um, arrow mark to address the direction of that straight line, okay? Okay, now why are we talking about vectors instead of pixels? in uh, feature space because each pixel can be located within this feature space right for example this specific pixel here right here and uh, you can use this pixel and uh, the origin of this coordinate system to create a vector like this consider this red line is a straight line and it is connecting this pixel of, of course, this pixel belongs to class one. It, it is connecting this pixel and the origin of this coordinate system. So we have a straight line and then we gave it a direction like this, right? So you can see that based on this specific pixel, we created a vector. So in feature space, usually we don't say pixels, we say vectors. So you can say each vector can be decided by a pixel, or you can say each pixel is associated with a specific vector in this feature space. So you can consider each vector as a pixel. So we just um, uh, replace pixel by vector because in feature space, you connect origin and each pixel, you can have a lot of vectors, right? So that's why we're calling uh, pixels vectors, okay, instead of actual pixels. Okay, so in this feature space, uh, we have uh, four classes and each one can be considered as a spectral class because, um, let me erase uh, this vector first. Because here in feature space, we don't have specific uh, land color type or land use, right? We only know there are four clusters of uh, pixels and each one, each cluster, I mean, each cluster can be considered as a spectral class um, because a, a cluster means that uh, there are some similar pixels in terms of um, spectral features, uh, they are getting together, they're close to each other. So it's natural to, to just um, consider all these uh, similar pixels as one class. Okay, so that's spectral class. So we also have information class. This is a type of uh, class we usually discuss in remote sensing, right? So um, here, it's still near infrared and red band, but this time we do not consider this as a spectral, uh, uh, we do not consider this coordinate system as a feature space because we are naming, we are giving each class here a specific 
name in real world. Okay, information class, a class specified by image analysts, which means that knowledge from human beings have been added into the classification. So all those spectral classes, they are not only numbers anymore. They're not class one, two, three, and four. They're vegetation, water, concrete, and something else maybe. So uh, usually uh, when we are facing our users, when we're doing research, when we're publishing a paper, when we're talking about class in remote sensing, by default, we mean information class. Spectral class is something you use, especially in unsupervised classification because computers can, can now tell you um, what specific land cover is for class one, for example. So, so uh, computers can only give you class one, class two, class three, class four. You can consider these classes as spectral classes, okay? Spectral class versus information, uh, sorry should be information class instead of information space. But this space here can be considered as information space. Okay, and this is um, a feature space. And in the information space, we have information classes. Okay, uh, more concepts here. Um, sometimes people just uh, use um, a land cover, sometimes they use land use. Uh, you really would consider them the same, but um, in order to be very accurate, let me tell you the difference between them. So land cover refers to the type of material present on the landscape. Okay, water, sand, crops, forest, wetland, human-made materials such as asphalt. So land cover is something very specific. It's about the material. Okay, okay. Land use is something more general. Land use refers to what people do on the land surface, right? Agriculture land, people do agriculture on a specific, uh, within a specific area. Um, agriculture is a type of land use, but within this land use, within a specific area for agriculture, there could be multiple land covers right? There could be water, right? Within agricultural land, there could be grass, there could be sand, there could be uh, just uh, wheat, corn, all those crops, right? So land use is a more general concept, or you can, you, you can consider um, uh, this as what people do on the land surface. But land cover is more specific, okay? And um, in order to to, to, to make it, um, to unify, to unify, to, to, to unify the use of different land, uh, use of terminology and other principles for land cover and land use. Um, different governments, okay, um, local government, um, usually this is done by a national government in the United States, a federal government uh, in China, central government in other countries. Each country has its land use and land cover classification schemes. And these schemes have been uh, applied uh, within a specific country or within countries. So um, local government, researchers, students, um, uh, industrial workers, they can all follow these schemes when, we are talk when they are talking about um, associated issues, okay? When we are, they are trying to address associated issues. So it's like a standard. Each scheme can be considered as a standard for land use and land cover. But the most famous one, um, I think around the world, not only in US, um, it is the US National Land Cover Data Set. It's called NLCD. It's for free online. And in your course project, um, uh, if you want to do a classification, you can use it as reference. Okay, and NRCD also provides classified remote sensing image for different areas within this country at different scales. Okay, but in your course project, do not simply use their results. Okay, that's plagiarism, that's cheating. Do not do that. You can use NRCD as reference in your course project, but since NRCD also provides a classified products of remote sensing image, 
um, you can simply download them and say, okay, this is uh, water, that is vegetation. Do not do that. Just uh, use what you have learned in this class to do classification uh, by yourself, okay? And here are some examples. Okay, so this is this is a table for Nash uh, for NLCD 2006 classification scheme, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can say uh, there are larger um, categories. For example, water, developed, barren, and under each larger category, there are subcategories. Okay, uh, the code one one is for open water. Code one two is for other type of water. For example, snow is another type of water. Right, ice is another type of water. So uh, you can say these tables can be very huge because it is done by the central government, by the federal government. Uh, they should cover all possible land cover and land use within a country. So people, um, people can just use these uh, standards schemes in their work. Okay, and here is another example. Um, ways uh, thematic maps. So uh, this is an LCD classification scheme uh, at country level, okay, at national level. So we can say there are pixels with different colors and each color is representing a specific uh, land cover or land use. We we'll say one one is for water, right? Lake Michigan here. Okay, uh, uh, ice and snow, we can see some um, white pixels uh, in Midwest. And uh, evergreen forest, uh, deciduous forest, you can say uh, even it's only vegetation. Actually, NLCD um, made very good work to give you even more specific category, even more specific uh, classification, okay? This is at national level, like I said. Uh, this is at state level. And uh, they can, sorry, they can also provide uh, even at city level data, okay? Okay, so um, this is just an example for, for classification system, um, or not a system. Classic, a very typical uh, national government administrated uh, land use, land cover classification scheme. Okay, so now let's get to the core of this lecture. It's about different steps and methods of image classification. So let's talk about general steps. Okay, so step one of classification is design image classification scheme. You don't necessarily have to design your own scheme. Sometimes we choose, okay, design or choose. So decide how many classes uh, will there be and what they are, okay? And also you need to choose a method or uh, later, later. Uh, uh, choosing a method doesn't need to be the first step, okay? So let's just say, Mm, design, let's just get it back to the original text here, okay? Step one, design image classification scheme. And within this step, simply uh, decide how many classes you need, okay, after the classification. So step two, conduct field studies, collect reference information and other ancillary data of the study area. This is not a necessary part because maybe some students, some uh, researchers, they have done this for you, okay? You can find a lot of reference um, spectral library from different agencies, NOAA, uh, USGS. But let me tell you what conducting field studies do. Um, you need to go to the field to survey the land cover uh, you are interested in, in terms of their spectral, characteristics. For example, uh, what's the spectral reflectance spectrum for vegetation from uh, visible light to near infrared? Okay, you, you say, oh, why do I need that? I can get that from, the, from, from remote sensors. You're right, but like I said, you're doing field work to establish a baseline or reference. 
sometimes they're not sometimes, mostly, most likely there will be disturbance and uh, the spectral, for example, the, the vegetation reflectance spectral you get from remote sensing image might not be that accurate. If that is the case, where can you find the reference? Where is uh, so-called correct or ground truth of vegetation reflectance spectra? The spectra from your field work, right? So that's a lot of work and it's expensive because you need to buy equipment, you, you need to send people there and pay them and they will need a lot of time to do that. But it's very important, okay? And, uh, and usually, for example, when you're doing a cost project, you don't have to do that, okay? You just need to use what has been provided for free online um, to find reference um, uh, spectral library. Um, that's it, okay? So step three, pre-processing, including radiometric, atmospheric, geometric, uh, topographic corrections, and image enhancement, etc., etc. And all these topics, we have talked about them in previous lectures, right? You have to do that before doing image classification. And then step four, generate training sites and spectral signatures. This step is exclusive to supervised classification because unsupervised classification doesn't need training sites, but Let's talk about it. So select uh, uh, representative areas on the image and analyze the initial clustering results, which means that in order uh, to let the software to have the ability to differentiate vegetation from water body, you need to collect some training sites for vegetation and for water and tell the software, okay, training sample sites, uh, so let's just say, training sample one, which includes a lot of pixels, is for vegetation. Training sample two, which includes a lot of water pixels, this sample is for water. Then the computer can just uh, do the classification based on what you have provided, okay? And step five, uh, image classification, eventually, okay? Uh, supervised model using training signature or training sites on uh, unsupervised mode, um, we use image clustering and clustering grouping method, okay? And after that, uh, you will have a thematic map, okay? Thematic map, uh, and each pixel should have been, uh, should, has, uh, should have been assigned a specific value. That value is the value for a specific class. Okay, if it was supervised classification, you have known which class is what, right? Class one is for vegetation, class two is for water. Uh, you have, you have uh, assigned those classes to different numbers when you finished collecting training sites, right? But if it is unsupervised classification, you only have uh, class numbers from, from the software. You have to decide which is which, okay? Is class, uh, is class one vegetation? Is class one uh, water body? You have to decide. And eventually step six, we have assessment, compare classification results with reference information. Here comes the NLCD. NLCD is reference information, okay? For example, according to your classification, a specific pixel is vegetation. Of course, you can find that uh, uh, the, that pixel's geographic location in the real world, right? And you can also using that location information to locate that pixel in an LCD data set. And if the result from an LCD is consistent with the result from your uh, classification in terms of that specific pixel, then okay, you're doing a good job because NLCD is the ground truth, remember that? If NLCD data says, okay, this pixel is vegetation, but according to your classification, that pixel is bare soil, then there must be, some, there must be something wrong with your classification method because we consider NLCD as the ground truth. 
Okay, so that's a very general assessment I just mentioned. It's just a very general example. Um, it's a qualitative method to do that. Okay, if that pixel is correct or not, we can also use a lot of quantitative methods to do more specific assessment in terms of the accuracy of your classification. I will introduce that later. Okay, okay. Uh, so step one for specifically supervised classification. Okay, because uh, from this slide, slide on, we're going to introduce supervised classification first. So first step, training set selection. Second step, spectral signature generation and evaluation. Of course, this step is based on training set selection. And in step three, apply decision rules or classification methods to unknown pixels. Okay, so how to do training site selection? An analyst may select training sites within the image that are representative of the land cover or land use classes of interest after the classification scheme is adopted. So for example, I have decided that uh, there should be four classes in the thematic map after the classification. So class one, water, class two, vegetation, class three, bare soil, class four, urbanized area, or say simply say urban. So then you need to find training sites for all four classes, okay? Training sites should be relatively homogeneous, which means that uh, when you're try trying to circle out training sites, you want to make sure that the circled area only contains one specific class. That is not possible in a real classification because um, you cannot be that accurate when you are picking out pixels for water body or for vegetation, but you have to make sure that it is as accurate as possible, okay? So each site, each site can be a single pixel, can be a large area, but each site is usually composed of many pixels, okay? Okay, that's, that's the usually situation, but if you picked only one pixel and call it a, a, a training site, yeah, it's okay, but we, we don't usually do that, okay? And the general rule is that if training sites are being extracted from N bands, then larger than, not, larger than 10 multiply N pixels should be collected for training sites of each class. What does it mean? It means that if you have three, if the image you are using for classification has uh, seven bands, seven bands will be used for classification, then you should have at least 70 pixels for each class. And the, this 70 pixels, let's just say we only have 70 pixels, they are training sites, okay? Uh, if you consider each pixel as a training site, but yeah, that's the general principle here. If you are using say four bands for classification and each class should have at least 40 pixels for training sites, okay? That's a principle. So here uh, I'm providing an example for selecting training sites, okay? So this is a remote sensing image and we can say that there are three uh, polygons here. Obviously, they are not natural because we can we can tell that from their boundaries, right? There is a sudden turn, turning here, right? Obviously, it's not nature. So this green polygon here is for vegetation. So this is a huge training site for vegetation. And when you're trying to circle it out, you want to make sure that uh, these pixels within this training site, they are all vegetation pixels. Like I said, that is not likely going to happen because it's very hard to make sure that this training site is so perfect, but at least when you're doing this, you need to be sure this area is covered by vegetation. For example, a forest, 
right? And pink is for water. Here is a pink training site for water, okay? And the right training site here is for urban, is for urban. So that's, that, that, that's an example for training site selection. So when you are doing lab, you would do the same thing, same thing. Okay, try to use your knowledge, try to use your knowledge and uh, spectral characteristics um, to find out all those pixels uh, for training sites of different classes. Okay, uh, here we have two photos um, um, portraying researchers doing in situ uh, spectral data collection. Okay, okay. So here in this image, how do you know this area is covered by, by vegetation? A very straightforward way is that you use um, you use red for near infrared band, right? And uh, in your image, all red pixels they are vegetation. That's the easiest way. But you can also use what spectral information of all those pixels to decide if they are um, if they are vegetation. But who should you compare to in terms of um, reflectance spectrum? You should compare to the reference spectral library and how to establish reference spectral library. You do field work. Okay, so field work is very important for remote sensing. Basically, field work is there for creating references and baselines. Okay, so then um, after uh, the selection of training sites, we need to, uh, to do a signature generation and evaluation. So selecting optimum bands to generate spectral signatures. Once the training statistics have been collected, a judgment must be made to, de to determine the bands that are most effective in discriminating each class from all others. This process is commonly called feature selection. Feature selection may involve both graphical and statistical analysis to determine the degree of between class separate, separability in the remote sensor training data. Sounds complex, but let me tell you uh, specifically what you need to do with vegetation pixels. So, you need to select the bands that are most effective in discriminating each class from all others. Let me ask you, if you want to discriminate vegetation from other land covers, which band should you use? Let me give you a tip. Get back to the reflectance spectra of vegetation. Still remember that very steep cliff between red band and near infrared band, that is the signature differentiating vegetation from other land covers. So in the classification, in the signature generation, it's very smart to include red band and near infrared band to differentiate vegetation pixels from other pixels, right? So red band and near infrared band they should be the bands, okay, that can be employed to effectively discriminating vegetation from other pixels. They're very convenient because together they form that huge, very steep leap, right, uh, a cliff, because vegetation has very low reflectivity, or you can say reflectance at red band, and has a very high reflectance at near infrared band. Okay, so you can also look at a picture and use graphical knowledge, use graphical information to differentiate pixel uh, vegetation pixels from others. For example, you can just assign green band as green in your remote sensing image. So it means it's true color. And when you're looking around in the real world, if it is green, it's most likely vegetation. It's, simi it's similar. If you assign green band as green in your remote sensing image, green parts of the image can be considered as vegetation. That is safe to say, 
right? And also you can use histogram and other statistical information uh, to differentiate uh, a specific class from other classes. Okay, so here you can say that signature generation and evaluation is a process um, requires a lot of prior knowledge and experience of analysts. Okay, so at the very beginning, you are a, a, you are a rookie in remote sensing. Uh, when you are trying to do signature generation and evaluation, you may feel confused, you may feel very difficult. Um, it's totally normal because you have never done this before. You have very limited experience. Okay, but yeah, um, now in future, uh, if you are going to do remote sensing work, uh, research application, you will be getting better and better. Okay, don't worry about that. Okay, here, um, uh, uh, selecting optimum bands to generate uh, spectral signatures. Uh, here we have some examples, right? We have four figures showing different spectral uh, feature space or uh, spectral space. Uh, so this is a combination of TM1 and TM3. This is a combination of TM2 and 4, TM3 and 4, TM4 and 5. We want to use different combinations to try and say which combination is good for which class, okay? So two-dimensional feature space plots of four pairs of Landsat TM data of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image we used before, okay? Okay, so um, for example, um, this is band three and band four, band two and band four. Okay, and for example here, band three and band four, some pixels, they're clustering here, a lot of pixels, they are right here. So maybe this combination can be used to differentiate a specific class from other classes. And within this class, all those pixels belong to this class. They are clustering right here. Okay, for now we don't know what, but that's just an example, right? Okay, so a more specific example here, okay? It's a combination of TM band four and TM band five. Okay, okay. So plot of the Charleston essay, Landsat TM training statistics for five classes measured in band four and band five, displayed as what? Let's just call them rectangles, okay? It's called Cospectral parallel laps, parallel lapipas, lapipas. Okay, it's a very complex word. Let's just call them. Let's just call them rectangles. Okay, the upper and lower limit of each uh, rectangle is positive, or you can say um, uh, positive, negative, one standard deviation from center. So. So we have five classes here. Class one is resident residential. Okay, all these pixels included in this uh, rectangle here, uh, they are con they're considered um, residential pixels. Class two, commercial. Class three, wetland. Class four, forest. Class five, water. You would ask, how did you know that? Of course, um, this is just the result. The author of this uh, scatter plot of this scatter plot, he or she must have um, used some prior knowledge to know that, okay, water pixels, um, they have very low value on band four, and they also have very low value for band five. That's the spectral characteristics of water pixels, right? Then all those pixels with very low band four value and band five values, they're right here, and these pixels should be water. Right, so use these two bands. These two, the combination of these two bands, they can be used to differentiate um, five classes from each other. Okay, okay. So uh, the the uh, the the mean value, the mean value of of all pixels within a rectangle, um, uh, the, can be calculated. Right. 
right? And uh, uh, that mean value for band four and the mean value for band five together, that pair of values can be located at a specific location, right? Right, uh, this yellow circle here. That's the uh, mean, or you can say this is the center of the rectangle, right? In terms of band four and band five. Okay, you can also calculate the standard deviation for, for, for all those pixels within this rectangle in terms of band four and band five. And you can use a uh, positive, uh, so add one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation um, to find out um, the limit. Okay, upper limit, lower limit, left limit, and right limit of this rectangle. So that's it. Okay, so this is an example using Fisher space, okay, to generate um, spectral signature for different classes. Okay, okay, then we're going to talk about different decision rules. We have collected training sites. Uh, we have decided how many classes we want, and we have um, generated. Uh, spectral signatures for all classes we want. And the next step is selecting a specific classifier or classification method or decision rules. They are the same thing. Okay, so a decision rule is a mathematical algorithm that performs the actual sorting of pixels into distinct classes. Okay, so here, each signature has been generated by you, by the analyst, right? And you can tell uh, the software right now, okay, these pixels, they're for commercial, these pixels, they're for residential, and et cetera, and et cetera. Okay, now software knows um, the, the, the features of different classes, spectral features of different classes. So next step, the computer will ask, the software will ask, what method should I use? Now I have the information, so tell me the method. I will use the method and the information you provided to do the classification. So now here are some commonly used methods or decision rules, okay? Um, we can use box method. We can use minimum, minimum state, uh, distance to means method, K nearest neighborhood method, and maximum likelihood method to finish supervised classification there you need to know that there are many more methods but these four methods they are very fundamental commonly used ones and i'm going to introduce them one by one but i will just stop here for this video and i will see you in the next video okay thank you